Dr. Finney, thank you so much for joining me today and taking the time out. We could not be more excited to have you as a speaker at MHS 2020. The way I maintained uh, my sanity during medical school, which is the world's largest, biggest ever survey course, <laughs> never getting any depth on anything. The way I maintained my sanity was going long bike rides. And what I learned very quickly, particularly in the mountains of, in the Bay Area in California, was if I didn't eat carbs starting the first hour, it was going to be a really bad trip home because once you hit the wall, it, you just feel terrible. Yeah. And so I was a, just experientially, I was an advocate of, of carbs and, and uh, endurance sport. Uh, and that was in the late 1980 or 1960s and early 1970s. And Bob Atkins' first book came out in 73. And I was doing my residency in, in Vermont. And I got into a dialogue with a couple of the uh, top diabetologists at the time who were also avid cross-country skiers. And one of them mentioned, hey, I was out with a friend of mine who went on this, this Atkins diet. I, said, I don't know how he did it, but he lost like 40 pounds. And we went out and did this 30-mile cross-country ski loop. And he, and he said, you know, every hour I had to stop and eat. And this guy didn't eat it at all. And it didn't seem to be impaired. And I said, it couldn't possibly be true. <laughs> How is this he happening? He was making carbs when you weren't looking. He was eating candy. And we decided that this was a conundrum and we should study it. And so they gave me the opportunity when I finished my residency without actually doing an endocrine fellowship to uh, spend a year and do a project. And we did a project in untrained uh, uh, obese patients, put them on a very low calorie ketogenic diet um, in a metabolic ward. We studied them over six weeks. And at one week, as predicted, their performance really went down. But after six weeks, they'd lost a lot of weight. We made them wear a backpack with all the weight they'd lost. We had them walking uphill on a treadmill. And they could walk longer, even carrying the backpack, than they did at baseline. And they hadn't trained during this process. Wow. And sort of took me under their wing, and I took courses at MIT, and we did a study in uh, highly trained bike racers. In this case, we fed them enough fat that they didn't lose cal or didn't lose weight and studied them over four weeks, and their prodigious performance statistics, which were very high in terms of peak power and endurance time to exhaustion at baseline, four weeks later, they hadn't changed. So they could do the same amount of work, but they did it on less than 10% of their energy coming from body carbohydrate reserves. Uh, and not, they were running on about 90% fat. And that was unbelievable. We got it published. And then, of course, the whole world collapsed because there was all this concern about ketogenic diets and sudden death because of a, a really disastrous diet called the liquid protein diet that was promoted in a, a popular book at the time. And the whole thing really got pushed into um, a, a very negative zone. And I pretty much gave up on that and worked on other things. So I met Jeff Wolick in 2003, and he'd read my papers, and he'd started doing low-carb research. And uh, I'd say, in all honesty, Jeff basically picked me up, dusted me off, and said, you know, you've got to get back into this. Uh, our big concerns were not that people could perform without many carbs or, or no carbs in the diet. The question was the long-term safety. And the work that Jeff and I have done – uh, since uh, the first publication was in 2006, together we've published about 15 papers, 18 papers since then. And it's really focused on safety of, of this. And once we had the safety stuff worked out, then we felt that, that we could offer this as a, a concerted science-based program. And we met um, the remarkable athlete, world champion for athletes, Sami Inkinen, who just happened to be a Silicon Valley golden boy because he's his first endeavor in a tech-based company resulted in it being sold for a few billion dollars. But he is a, a highly trained endurance athlete had uh, actually developed uh, type uh, or uh, pre-diabetes and he was eating 60 or more percent of his calories as carbs. And a lot of them is unprocessed carbs. I'm sorry, it's highly processed carbs, you know, the gels and, and the sugar solutions and, you know, Gatorade and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so that's what really led us eventually to uh, put together Verta uh, and to do the you know, this, this amazing study with Dr. Sarah Hallberg in Lafayette, Indiana, with you know, intervening with 260 people with type 2 diabetes. And it's just been a remarkable odyssey. Well, our, our results are that we started with people with mostly longstanding diabetes. Um, so the average duration of, since diagnosis was over eight years. Um, and they're quite heavy. Uh, and uh, we actually 
Um, we don't make a big deal out of it because it, it really didn't make a difference. But half of the, of when we recruited almost 400 people with either pre-diabetes or diabetes, the diabetes cohort number 260 patients. Then we had about 130 people with pre-diabetes. And they were allowed to select between either coming in to meetings in Dr. Hallberg's clinic, so coming to the bricks and mortar clinic and meeting uh, 26 times over the course of one year for group-based plus one-on-one -on -one sessions for individualization. But that's how I know in pre my previous experience with using ketogenic diets for weight loss, you know, I knew I could do it that way uh, in a group-based intervention. Uh, and then uh, because they were on, they had diabetes and on medications, they had telephone access to Dr. Hallberg and to their coach to uh, help them with uh, the prompt changes in medication that are required for this to be safe. The other group got all this, this um, instruction and interaction through a simple, or to, through a, a cell phone app. They didn't come in except for research visits three times over the course of the first year. And I knew I could do it in a group based setting, but again, like my experience with thinking I knew better, um, you know, I figured that, that doing this in an impersonal way, doing it pure telemedicine through an app, uh, was not going to work as well. And the answer is, the different, there were no significant differences between the, the results of the two groups, but on average, the app-based group did slightly better. Wow. So it's again, the situation, fun. I mean, I love this in science, because the beauty of science is actually coming up with a hypothesis that you think is right and improving our own. Right. Yeah. That's what science should be. And, and I, I won't give you the, the long list of places where I've been, been proving myself wrong, but I, you know, something I, I just like to do because it, it means I can, you know, we can learn from doing these things. But anyway, the result is that one year, um, the hemoglobin A1C, uh, which started out at 7.6, and most of these patients were on multiple medications, uh, dropped to 6.2, wow. which is a, and we removed more than half of their medications. Uh, for those people on insulin, there were 90 patients on insulin, and uh, half of those patients, we completely removed the insulin. Some of them have been on it for years. Wow. And in 42%, uh, so 50%, we, 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 we stopped the insulin, and 42%, we reduced the dose. Um, uh, we stopped all sulfonylureas. And insulin and sulfonylureas are the two most dangerous medications in terms of causing hypoglycemia. Um, and then most other medications other than metformin, we, we had re actually reduced the amount of medication. And so we got a very significant reduction in hemoglobin A1C uh, with less medicine, which you know, every diabetologist tells you it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's so counterintuitive that they'd all think it would be impossible. Well, two things. One is we have kind of promoted the term reversal because it's not cure and it's not remission. It isn't like, oh, you can stop doing this treatment now and you'll be okay. Uh, you have to keep, once you have type 2 diabetes as the severity that our average patient had, we can't stop the carb restriction. We can individualize it and people's type carb tolerance will vary one from another. So we like the term reversal because it's an active process. You know, if you go down a dead end street and you realize it's a dead end street, you can turn around and go back the other way. So you're reversing, going the other way backwards, but you're moving. It's, it's a dynamic process. Whereas remission or cure would not be considered a dynamic process. And our patients have to understand that, that this is an ongoing active thing they have to do. Uh, to, to achieve success.